So the spreadsheet is um, sent around once a month, around the 15th, um, and we have a long distribution list. It's also being posted on the IRFIC website under uh, the 2020 uh, uh, COVID reports. Um, so that's being regularly updated and it's also posted on the ACE website. Um, and what we try to do is capture all of the cruises that are going on in the Pacific Arctic um, this year. Um, and we're sending this specifically out to coastal communities to uh, kind of like give them an overview of what's happening and how things are changing. Um, and the spreadsheet captures the vessel name, whether it's scheduled, canceled, postponed, uh, the, uh, the date of um, departure and return, the location, uh, the approximate location where the cruise vessel is going to uh, be operating in, the funding agency, a POC for the research uh, community, um, and for the vessel operators, and then the project title. And so far, everything that is yellow right now has been updated in the last um, last update in June. Uh, everything in red down here has been canceled uh, before. Um, and yeah. That's, those are most of the updates I have. There have been a couple of cancellations for uh, some of the Dyson cruises, um, the Southeast Bering uh, Sea Integrated Ecosystem Survey and the Walleye Pollock. One has been canceled. Uh, the Northern Bering Sea Survey um, has been canceled. Uh, the Canada's Three Oceans um, has been canceled on the DBO line as far as I know, um, but there's still, the Canada site still is going out and it's going to do some buoy recoveries. Um, the Southeast Bering Sea uh, Survey Bottom Dwelling Fish Survey has been canceled. And then for some of the cruises um, highlighted here in yellow that are still scheduled, most of the departure and arrival uh, docks have changed. And most of them are going out of Seward now or either going in and out of Japan and um, or in and out of Victoria. Um, so yeah, those are all the cruise updates that I have for now, but I, I know that um, um, Jackie had a conversation with David Allen the other day, but I haven't, I haven't heard what came out of that. Yeah, when you're ready for, do you want updates now or just email them to you? Uh, um, I can tell you a few things uh, on your lower, the Canadian is going without any scientists, you know that, the top one's Wilfrid Laurier. Uh, that was scheduled for July from Victoria. That will still go, but only with crew. Uh, I noticed that on your after your blue line on the bottom, you've got it listed mm -hmm. in July. We never go July, so that June. June, so it's always in July, just to let you know for the Laurier. Um, if you go back to your top list on the air on, it's going to be a later cruise, so we need to update that. Um, I'm looking up, the, but it's going to be in the fall. It's now the Noah Oscar Dyson, and I can give you the the most recent dates of, out of as of this morning, which is still pending, but it's August 19th from Seattle to Kodiak. So it's August 19th to September 22nd. And I'll leave that one. Uh, it's going to be, uh, uh, yeah. So it's not the fair weather anymore. It's the Oscar Dyson. Okay. I'm just taking notes while. Well, I think okay, that's so I noticed that uh, Meredith did put in the chat um, a location where uh, you can mm -hmm. find uh, the spreadsheet. Um, so if anybody wants to take maybe a, a slower look at this, um, that would be a good location to look. And, um, you know, Anne and um, the environmental intelligence team, Candace Nachman, Molly McCammon, and Roberto Delgado have really uh, shepherded uh, uh, keeping track of uh, this research crew status. So we really want to give a shout out to that uh, collaboration team for that effort. Um, I do notice before we move on that there is a question from Wilbert in the chat that asks if there's a similar overview for the Eastern Arctic. Um, I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that question. Uh, it's, it's not the same and somebody else can do that, but I do know that the, uh, because I'm on the board for the Nansen Legacy for the, uh, the cruises that are going out into the uh, Atlantic sector. Um, so, but as far as the ones going into Baffin Bailey, do you have anything related to the well, Amundsen? Well, the, the Amundsen schedule has been sharply uh, reduced uh, in terms of where they're going. They're, they're, they're not going to be doing much work in the Canadian Arctic this summer. Okay. 
But if I could say that I don't, as detailed as this, uh, I don't know of this and for the uh, Atlantic sector. It's something we can recommend to certain people. I think because we have the Bering Sea or Bering Strait yeah. of choke point, it's probably more challenging to do to do this for the, the Eastern Arctic. And the only thing I would add is that yeah. Amundsen Science out of the University of Laval would probably has a detailed uh, listing of everything related to uh, Baffin Bay area. I know we have U.S. scientists connect, uh, collaborating with the Greenlandic folks uh, and other countries that are planning cruises in 2021. But I think everything that's in that Canadian water, Greenland sector, there's probably Amundsen Science is a good first start as well as the Nansen Legacy Program out of Tromsø. Right. Yeah. Um, if okay, great. Has, Thank you. If anyone has any, thanks. If anyone has any updates on cruises or notice that I'm missing any, please just email me and I can drop my email in the chat box in a minute. Um, yeah. And if you want to be on the distribution list to receive this once once a month for the update, um, let me know as well and I can add you. I would. <laughs> I think you might be sending it to my wrong email. <laughs> so. Double check. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. <laughs> So do we do you, hi Catherine. Uh -huh. So we should we start with some uh, of the two presentations we know about or, but I see Catherine's on the uh, the screen. Are you presenting Catherine first or or do you want to pres uh, say, give an update? No. Okay. I just see your Sorry. name. <laughs> oh, that, that, that looks great. <laughs> so uh, maybe we could start with uh, um Ken, do you want to start and then care or Karen first whatever I guess we have to pull up Karen's slide. Ken, do you have slides? No, I don't, Jackie. We'll just uh, go on like this. Um, okay. um, I, we got a tremendous thunderstorm passing overhead and I keep losing the connection. So if you lose me, I'm sorry. Um, and then if it gets real bad on voice, I'll just turn off the video. Thanks. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and give your update and then Karen can plan to do so. And maybe you can get her slides in the queue while Ken, Ken babbles. Yeah, this will be, <laughs> thanks Jackie. Uh, uh, I meant to keep this brief, there's no reason to, to go along because there's not a whole lot to say for the uh, BLELTER. Um, and we, we, our April field season on the ice was canceled, as I mentioned last time. Um, we should be up there at this moment uh, during a breakup at uh, Okiavik and Central Beaufort at Aprudo and also at Kaktovic and Eastern Beaufort, and that's not happening either. Uh, our last hope is, uh, is August. Uh, our August full season normally starts the 1st of August and goes through toward the end of August. Um, that is extremely unlikely to happen with a, fill, a full field team. Most likely what we're going to be doing if we do can get anything done is uh, uh, with a, a small response, a, a, a small team of five or six individuals that will um, try to get some critical sampling done, but more, but more, what we're most interested in is retrieving instruments that have been in the seabed for the past year and deploying and replacing those in deployment of new instruments. We've got at least 10 moorings uh, across the Beaufort Sea coast and that doesn't include the moorings that Jeremy, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy has uh, deployed as well um, from UAF. So, um, Jeremy Casper. So I, I don't have, at this point, we're probably looking at a, uh, using our group in Alaska, um, we have, a, we have three PIs in Alaska and their students, but that's, we have other issues to deal with in terms of getting boats in the water and what have you. And under the current um, situation with a mandatory two week quarantine period uh, in Alaska at a hotel, either Fairbanks or Anchorage, plus if you go to Yukavik, plus another five days on the ground, we're looking at 19 days minimum before a single data point or, or sample can be collected if you're working out of Ukiavik slash Barrow. Um, that's just uh, un, unreasonable. Um, I, I wouldn't ask, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't ask any students or staff to sit in a hotel for two weeks plus again, five days. It's just not good for your mental health either. So anyhow, I, um, 
I don't, we're working on different possibilities here, but uh, it's going to be a very abbreviated field program in August if it happens with a very small number of people. And that's where we stand. We have another field program with BOEM. Um, well, Kathy is on and others from BOEM. We're, that's out of Prudhoe, out of uh, Endicott. Um, and uh, we're working with our colleagues at Hillcorp to figure out if we can um, do anything there for a couple of weeks, but that's a separate project from the BLELTR program. That's a bone funded program that was also a couple of weeks in duration. Again, um, they're on a very, uh, very tight in Prudhoe on, uh, they haven't really had, they haven't had any cases they state and they don't want any uh, for a good reason. So things, um, so we're looking, talking to them, their safety folks, in terms of what we can and cannot do and what kind of preparations we have to make if we are going to um, work out of, uh, out of Stephenson Sound in central Beaufort. So I think that sums it up, Jackie. I just want to highlight real quick that uh, Betsy Baker had uh, a comment for you and said that Alaska has changed its quarantine requirements. And if you show a negative test 27 hours pre-departure, you can enter a shorter quarantine. And she said she's going to provide some links as well. Awesome. Thanks. I'll look forward to uh, That's really potentially great news. <laughs> really, yeah. All right, uh, Karen, do you want to uh, give a little of your brief update? Sure, can you hear me? You, yes, you can. Okay, I guess I could turn myself on too. Um, so there were slides in uh, somewhere, and I don't know if anyone's gotten them up so we can share them or not. I think Anne, Anne I think they're up on the website. Can you bring up her three slides? Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I'm just going to briefly update on the Mosaic project. And you can find a lot of this um, by following Mosaic on their um, sort of daily update thing. I've been back a week from like three. I was supposed to be back in early April. So you can tell right away that things aren't um, going as originally planned. Um, and well, I'm still hoping to see the slides. But anyway. Um, so Kari, we've got, there are people, scientists and crew for like four out there. Okay, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so you can go to the next slide, please. Or can I do it? No, I think I have to do it. Okay, it's, just, it's only three slides. Go. This is a big deal. You know <laughs> Oops, that doesn't look quite right. <laughs> um, so, <There> we go. <laughs> okay, well, sort of, it's still sort of cut off, but, um, so what these two slides show are the on the left is the entire drift track of the mosaic expedition um, starting at the beginning which was in september when they first set up the ice camp until the most recent um the end of lake three and the bottom of it that is cut off right now but what i wanted to point out is that in addition to dealing with logistic issues posed by um the pandemic and also by ice conditions Another interesting thing is that the mosaic ice flow drifted an awful, quite far in the, um, during the Lake 3. So on the, on the left, we've got the entire drift track, and on the right, we've got the Lake 3 only drift track. And it was 44% of the drift miles were conducted during Lake 3. So if you were, were to go to the mosaic, uh, follow mosaic app, they call it an app, but it's just really a website, and turn on the um, projected drift track, you'll see that the ice station has drifted way ahead of where it was supposed to be. They thought it might be where it is by August, perhaps, um, but instead it's, it's, it's there in, in June. So, um, so Lake, can you go to the next slide, please? The last slide. <laughs> and then can you make it so that the, um, I don't know, can anybody see the, the text? Because right now I've got it, it's all cut off. Yeah, and you might try stopping share and then sharing again just to see if that, no, it doesn't. Uh, I'll try. So, um, so as I was saying, Lake 3 was supposed to end at the end of, it, it, in early April. Uh, we had, um, had been planned to be done by some larger fixed wing aircraft. We had some issues with the ice the, the runway was kind of cracking, but in addition, that was sort of when the pandemic had really um, roared into, um, there you go, thank you, had to roar into being in, in full force. 
And so any options to use smaller aircraft and still do a, an exchange were not possible because Norway was closed and particularly uh, Svalbard, which was had been where the aircrafts would have been staged from. So the end of leg three was postponed quite a bit. In the end, um, it was accomplished by the Polarstern leaving the ice flow and sailing to um, Svalbard. So um, on May 15th, or actually it was May 16th, I, it was a typo for me, um, or I should have said, I know we left it, we left on May 16th, we left the ice flow to go to Svalbard. If you look at the map on the left, what they did is they color coded this map, and this is from their quote unquote app, the website, just type in follow mosaic and you'll get to it. Um, and you'll see that the blue is the drift track. That's what they're calling the drift track and the gray is transit. So the big gray on the east is when the Polar Stern first went up to set up the, uh, establish the, the ice camp. Um, and then the blue is that whole drift track that I showed you in the previous slide. And you'll see that this is the, the you can see the location of the Polar Stern this morning on uh, GMT. And if you look, but there's like, a, the, you'll notice there's a gray gap between the blue and, and the location of Polar Stern. And that's what the ice station, how the ice station drifted between when we left with Polar Stern to go to the long year buy-in and when we and when the Polar Stern rejoined it. So it, it actually moved quite far south um, in the month after we left the, after we left the flow. Um, so we, we took about two weeks, um, or a little two and a half weeks to get out. The ice was very compressed. We had a lot of, of um, winds from, from the north that were jamming it um, in between the, into the Fram Strait area there. Um, we finally got to um, Longyear Bayan and, and did um, met up with two German research vessels, the Zana and the Maria Marion, which had come up from Bremerhaven. Um, talking about two-week quarantines, the Leg 4 participants and the Leg 4 Polar Stern crew and the crews of those two research vessels all had to quarantine for two weeks prior to the beginning of their trip up to the Polar Stern in uh, Longyearbyen. Um, the quarantine was done in, um, in um, Bremerhaven in a hotel. Nobody else was in the hotel except for the participants and the crew. And uh, the first week was an isolated quarantine and they were test multiple, tested multiple times for the virus. Um, they all tested negative after the two weeks. And so they were all um, transferred to the transfer vessels by um, just by chartered bus. And there was no contact with anybody. And, um, and they sailed out of um, Bremerhaven at the, oh, I can't remember what date, I didn't put it on the map, but, um, we all finally met up on June 4th um, in Advent Fjorden, which is part of East Fjorden. And we were actually looking at um, the town of Longyearbyen, but we did not go ashore. There was no transfer of anything between the, the two. Um, and we spent four days transferring crew, transferring science cargo, um, new, new cargo coming in. We sent out a lot of cargo and also um, refueling the Polar Stern. And then on the 8th of June, the Polar Stern sailed north towards the ice flow. Um, she arrived on June 17th, and the scientists there are busily um, reestablishing some of the infrastructure that like three had taken down because there was a lot of uh, the, the ice pack was very dynamic at the, in, um, at the beginning of May. And um, they're getting to work again um, at, at the ice flow. Um, and uh, it took me, um, I, we left, um, on June 8th as well, and I got home um, on the 16th. So it took me a little over a week to get home. We sailed to Bremerhaven and then and then flew back from Frankfurt. So the plan going forward is that there, at the, at the moment it's planned that there'll be a, another exchange um, with leg five, for leg five scientists and crew that would start sometime in mid August. Again, we expect that this would be um, preceded by a quarantine period um, and then as always planned the anticipated return date of Polar Stern is sometime in mid-October. Um, and I just want, one thing I want to emphasize is that at one point um, there had been planned to be a scientific aircraft visiting the, um, the mosaic flow um, in March. And it, during the training and then or after some group training, it was discovered that some of the people who had been going to participate in that, they tested positive for the virus and so that whole campaign was canceled and that was reported in the news 
but um, and some of my friends and relatives thought that that meant that we had the virus at the mosaic ice flow, but we have never we never had the virus. It was just people um, back on mainland Europe who had tested positive, and and they were part of mosaic because they were supposed to come up, but they they never came. So we never had the virus, and I think of it as um, an extra three months of innocence. So um, and science has been proceeding. We got a lot of work done on Lake Three, um, and. We're looking forward to seeing what the Lake Four and Lake Five teams uh, find out during the summertime. That's it. All right. Thanks, Karen. Does anybody have any questions for Karen or for uh, uh, Ken before we move on? Okay. Then, is, does anybody else have any uh, updates uh, they want to bring forward, either by cruises or key results or upcoming? Uh, Science planning. Let's see if you put stuff in the chat. I, I would just say that we have been working uh, on the uh, the Dyson cruise with the uh, DBO Eco Force Foci cruise. Have been working now lately, daily, trying to get nightly. this or nightly <laughs> to get something, and it's starting to move forward on on the timing uh, with the quarantine aspects in Seattle. Uh, separation from what was originally put into the ocean station pop on the way north. Now it looks there'll be two separations. Uh, we've got a quarantine COVID-19 protocol uh, in place and we hope to have pegged down the timing on that. The plan would be to be depart from um, Seattle, go through Unimac Pass, uh, uh, take the inside map passage, Unimac Pass. There'll be a lot of moorings with crew uh, deployments. Um, and then the science party would be doing this sampling on primarily the DBO one through five lines, uh, doing the core measurements that uh, we had proposed as part of our collaborative effort uh, with the uh, eco foci doing uh, zooplankton work and then all the moorings. We will be deploying a new NPRB funded sediment trap in the M8 mooring Phyllis's in the northwest, uh, southwest of St. Lawrence Island, the DBO one area, and then turning around Seth uh, Danielson's uh, uh, Chukchi Environmental uh, Observatory up in the Northeast Chukchi Sea with a sediment trap and the whole system up there. And then uh, returning back uh, through Dutch without any stop, obviously Unimac, and then going to Kodiak. So that, that's currently the way the plan uh, is right now. And it's, uh, we'll have more information uh, on, as it's provided. But we hope to peg this down in the next week. Jackie? Yes. This is Ken. I just want to tell you that um, I haven't had my hair cut in a really long time. I couldn't tell, I'm, but I was and being I'm, nice. I'm, and, I'm, and I'm protesting. I am not going to cut my hair until I get in the field in the Arctic. And I'm, if I don't make it, we're all going to be looking at somebody with ponytails. I'm going to have to get on one of your ships just so I can cut my hair. Okay? <laughs> so I got to get there. All right. All right. The gangway's up. We're not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Yeah, it'll be a return to the 1970s, right? Yeah, I do. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm a graduate student again. I just, but without, but yeah, hopefully without not the grad student salary. <laughs> that's, that's right. I think and we could just not get on a cruise just to see our hair really long. Yeah. The other update I would just say so there's a, the Mirai cruise from Japan, so they're going directly from Japan up to primarily they'll do a DBO. Uh, they're actually, the Japan's going to do DBO one, two, three, and then move up to the Chukchi borderlands. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a map for you on that. Um, and the dates are moving into fall and they're having uh, discussions with the local community up in Ukiavik um, related to their- uh, I have, uh, so we had uh, sent out the special in June and then heard back uh, from some of the the people up in, in Alaska and they were very concerned about the timing of the Mariah cruise and some of the others um, about them going into the time of bowhead migration season uh, and getting kind of into that area. So we forwarded that email um, and provided some of the um, the documents for, um, what's it called? Yeah, that's right. And we knew this back in when Candace uh, was presented because they have uh, a Japanese college have usually go to Yukiavik and have discussions with the AWC. That's how they cleared it the last time when it was in October. Yeah. 
But this time, obviously, because of COVID, uh, so I'm recommending that they actually get on that virtual call in July. But I know mm -hmm. there's having discussions with uh, with them about that that issue because of the, you know, the everything's happening later in the fall, including pushing those cruises. The air, so that mainly is that's the Mirai, the uh, the Laurier one will work over to the Borderlands area more. So I don't think that's really going to that that doesn't seem to show up with the AWC. The Louis Saint Laurent for the Beaufort Island Environmental Observatory, that one, and we have been in contact with the PI about that meeting. And this was all brought forward for after the last AWC that they needed to discuss more with the AWC. And the Korean cruise is um, delayed, but still into the August period. So they are going to just do the DBO3 and then they're moving up into the Chukchi borderland. So that one doesn't show as being an issue on that. I do know in the I do know in the fall that there is the because um, I bought the cards out on a cruise in the Atlantic and I think you have it on your your list but he has an Aon Art Observing Network cruise and the off of the um, DBO six he's going to occupy and I know there's some discussions on that because that period I think his cruise is going to be in uh, October uh, and November and so that one is an, and then Craig Lee's got that work. Uh, working off the Healy in the fall, and that's still a go on the Healy, my understanding. So, All right. Uh, one Sequoia piece that was highlighted as well, um, but I forwarded the email to uh, to all the PIs, so they should all be aware. And I've heard back from people from the Mirai, and they, they have said that they've been in contact with the Alaskan community to talk Good. about that. Good. So. And, and I know that Seth is in quarantine now at Seward, <laughs> getting ready to go on their uh, another one of the LTER cruises, so I, I uh, I'll, I'll just leave that. So we can discussions there. <laughs> so that's all I have on the on the cruise update part. Any other comments? If not, I will give you an update on the. Um, and this is the World Wildlife Fund contact, but also others about the potential of opening up a fisheries, the Russians uh, may be putting out a, a permits to do a polica uh, or, or a pollicot, oh. or pollock in the Chukchi Sea on the Russian side. And so this is causing quite a bit of concern um, that there's one, that there's fish, and even though it's supposedly midwater trawl, none of those midwater trawls that sit on shallow shelves stay there. And so this is one of our, you know, the Chukchi is a really a hot spot for benthic feeding animals as well as benthos and all the other high ecosystem parts that we've done with Comida and Ambon and all these acronyms, uh, the, the uh, environmental, you know, the CSEP program and so forth. But I would just plant that out there um, because I have, as of yesterday, even had a, uh, a news person try to, and I haven't answered that one back because I don't know the answer to this, but the, the contacts in Russia say that they are, putting the bids out for some type of a fisheries, although they don't know if anybody's gonna bid on it because they don't know that there's enough fish, but the, uh, it's coming. That's all I, that's, that's all I know on that. <laughs> so it's gonna be really important for whatever cruises out there to look at what those bottom water temperatures are and any type of uh, look at the at the ecosystem because of the changes that you know we all had since the 2018-19 and commercial fish going northward. Yeah, does uh, Jackie by chance do you know um, if uh, you had mentioned some of the uh, cruises associated with gathering information for the DBO? Do you know if there's any updates on uh, the Ambon cruise? I know that they were thinking of. Uh, chartering a vessel? The, the, sorry, I should have, you know, I get the acronym down. Uh, the AMBON, so AMBON is part of our, our joint uh, eco, DBO eco foci. They are going to put somebody on to collect eDNA on that, but the ship won't allow any trawling off of it because of the huge mooring activities that's going and the way the ship is configured. So we will have that collaboration uh, with, with AMBON as part of that, uh, that Dyson cruise in August and September. Okay. Uh, we were looking at alternatives uh, as backups in case uh, things didn't move forward uh, on the Norseman too, but those are act those. Uh, it doesn't look like that's going to happen because the the Dyson's going to move forward, 
And at the timing, it's just impossible to try to pursue anything further on, the, on that aspect. I do know the Norseman too is doing the Bering Strait moorings for Rebecca Woodgate. So I have been in conversation with her this week. I think that cruise leaves in September 6th. And right now it's standing as a uh, crew only deployment of, of her mooring, same as it is for the, for the Dyson. Um, so for the mooring uh, capabilities, that seems to be way it, it's go. Cause you either have to, you know, you either have to quarantine obviously in Alaska or quarantine in, in Washington to be able to get on some of these vessels. They, yeah. they do have a streamlined um, COVID-19 yes, protocol that seemed simpler and less time consuming and less expensive for the clients who are hiring the ship. Right. And it's approved by the state of Alaska. Right. And I would only say for the Asian, I know for the China, the Japanese and the Koreans, they're loading their ships in either Incheon or in uh, outside Tokyo. I don't know where the name was that they're actually having their, uh, uh, their port that they're coming out of. But then they're going to move offshore for two weeks and quarantine offshore, but within a flight capability in case anything happens after the COVID testing. So, um, I think the same thing sort of built into the Healy's. So. Right, and the Healy's, because that was in the uh, AACC call the other day. They have a 14-day, so cruises that are going out on the, for Sekuliak or, uh, are 14 days, so even the Healy, I think, are 14 the, days in Seward. Yeah. Right. And then spending some time offshore of Kodiak yeah. while they've got people on board. Okay. Any other comments people want to make? It's kind of an abridged, obviously, field season. Are there any coastal observations besides what Ken was mentioning that maybe anybody wants to provide updates on? I, 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 I'll shut my mouth. <laughs> okay, well, I'll open it again. Uh, I would say that the, um, I know the Synoptic Arctic Survey that some of you might know that has been developing on the international level. There were multiple cruises planned to go out. I know that uh, Japan and Korea are part of that. They will do part of this uh, moving into the basin, but a lot more bridged this year because of the having to go that distance from their home countries. Um, and then Canada would be doing something with the Beaufort Gyre. The Nansen Legacy is going to move theirs off to 2022 into the basin, most likely. Uh, they will have cruises going uh, across the Barrett Sea and into uh, this, the slope area uh, seasonally. They missed all the seasonal part this year, so they're doing that in 2021. Um, I know that China is planning to uh, do a crossing back uh, in the uh, Arctic and be working on the Pacific sector, but I don't have an update on what the uh, the Zhulong 2 plans are at this time. Oh, and everybody might know that the Healy is planning to go through the uh, uh, Canadian Arctic Archipelago next in August of 2021. And there is an opening for opportunistic uh, participation. I think there was an announcement that came across the internet. If you don't have it, then maybe somebody can put the link on it. And so they will be taking, you can't sample in the Canadian Arctic uh, as a transit from west to east, but once it gets into Baffin Bay, the, in collaboration with Canadians and uh, others, that there's a possibility for opportunistic sampling on that. Uh, that's, that's great. And actually, uh, Jackie, something, um, I guess, to add on that, and uh, I think if anybody's interested, uh, I might need to provide some more information, but um, uh, BOEM has um, an agreement with the Smithsonian um, Natural History Museum about uh, providing vouchers for inverte different invertebrate specimens. Um, and I know Ken um, and Katrin, I don't, Jackie, I don't know if you've done any collections uh, for them, but I think they're trying to expand um, their uh, Arctic species list. And so they uh, provide some funds for sending said vouchers. Um, we're working with them for accounting for paying, you know, for PI's times to collect vouchers because it's not, you know, a minimal ask to get things uh, gathered. Ken, did you, do you have any like uh, thoughts on when you collected? Was it pretty uh, time? Oh, no, no, it's, it's, well, yeah, I mean, you, you got to spend, you have to dedicate some time, of course, to 
bringing, making sure you have 200 proof alcohol, they, they like it at 100% alcohol for the possibility of doing later genomic work. Um, and yeah, there, I mean, there's not a lot of work to it, of course, uh, but it's just taking the time to isolate those, um, those organisms and get them into um, the vials that they send you in, in the 200 proof alcohol. And uh, I think the biggest biggest challenge is getting is getting 200 proof alcohol to the Arctic coast. Uh, you know, it's, it's all, there's a lot of constraints, shipping constraints. But in any event, that's uh, no. I think it's a really great program, and we've been doing it for a very very long time. Even back to the Oxup days, uh, we have been we've been trying to provide these voucher specimens, as Jackie and Lee both know. So, uh -huh. um, but yeah, I think it's I think we need to be doing this as much as we can. We've got a lot of taxonomic uh, challenges ahead of us, and uh, we need to get those settled as things rapidly change in the benthos. As Jackie was just talking about warm water, I mean, things are changing very quickly and we need to be able to document them. And we've got to be talking the same apples and oranges here when we, we can't be calling the same thing two or three different names. Right, Jackie? Right, and, and I would just say too, is that, you know, particularly has eDNA and genomics becoming so the thing to do, we will be doing some on the uh, uh, Dyson cruise, but it, also means you have to know what the eDNA comes from. And the only way, you have to have that associated with the correctly ID taxonomy. Tech, and that comes from the taxonomist identifying it and not necessarily like a, a sorter type thing. So it's really critical to have, have those and to work with the Smithsonian and others. You know, we spend a lot of time with the, with the experts and other, even other countries trying to make sure the taxonomy, let alone our own country. So we're talking apples and apples like Ken says. Yeah, that's and that you've heard this, Kathy. This is exactly what we were talking about earlier with, with these folks is that we were hoping that they could provide some taxonomic assistance, and um, that's limited. And that's why we've been working, we have no choice but to work with people all over the globe. And when it comes to different groups, whether they're polychaetes or we're talking about Ascidian, uh, Eurocordates, Ascidians, or Bryozoans, the expert Bryozoan people, or in Poland, and, and uh, that's. Jackie nailed it. We, you've got to know what the, you've got to have a taxonomist tell you what they think it most likely is down to species. And then at the same time, link that to the genomics. Um, and that's, that's, that's a tough, that's a link we've been having some tough time with. I'm going to throw out a question to everybody on it because I noticed that Evie and Don Anderson were on board. Is there any update on the harmful algal bloom or the folks in Alaska as far as the, the network? in Alaska. There's Don. No. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I see Evie. Um, I was just going to say just a little bit. Uh, right now, all we're getting is the reports of some toxicity down in southeastern Alaska. There's really no data whatsoever up in uh, up to the north uh, in the Bering Strait and, and, and further north, we're, you know, we, we were supposed to have our cruise in less than two or three weeks from now, but, but that's, that's canceled. So we're not gonna have any, we don't have any information. We won't have any, we were hoping to participate in your cruise, Jackie, but it's just all of the quarantine issues and personnel uh, prevent that. So I think we may go a year without our own people being on on the on board, but we hope to try to get samples from other cruises. I just say, I wish I could, wish I knew more, wish I could say more, but that's it. Yeah, so I was, I would just say on, on the Dyson cruise, if everything goes, we will be collecting, you know, sediments for you that we can do. It's uncertainty on the, on the volume of the water, but we can talk offline. And mm -hmm. then we will collect uh, uh, some of the dominant, uh, uh, clams and with for Kathy, uh, mm -hmm. Kathy uh, Lefay. Lefay. Yeah, Lefay. Right. Yeah. So that still is in the planning uh, with a very limited, you know, people we have and and because uh, it's going to be basically a very small component doing a lot as much as we can, uh, but it'll be on those on those set lines. But I was curious on uh, the information you had, but also is are there any community collections going on while the rest of us are not offshore? You know anything near shore by local? Not that I know of in terms of plankton samples. Uh, there's a standing request for shellfish or other animals that might be affected that, that can be analyzed, but uh, not 
that that that's rather difficult sampling and difficult to get things shipped to us for the plankton. So and they've been lots and lots of cruises. So we've haven't haven't looked too hard to try to get things from shore. But this year it's a whole new ball game, and, and I guess we're behind the eight ball in being able to turn to the to the communities. But we they would need special kits with the right kind of materials for sampling and shipping and preserving, and, and we're just not set up for that. And, and that being said, though, there there is something called an AHAB network for the Alaskan HAB program, and they are trying to coordinate lots of different sampling activities in there. So there are some of those going on, but most, to my knowledge, are down again in the southeast. Hmm. Okay. Anybody else? The only thing I would say on synthesis, because uh, there's a you know central Arctic Ocean that's become an issue of potential fisheries going uh, north, and because of the fisheries, the 2018 uh, closure or the 16-year uh, agreement to do more science before you make a the precautionary approach. So there's various uh, governmental. And I know Candace is on the line here. If I don't know if she wants to chime in on anything related to the 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 new not what used to be the fiscal, which was the fisheries uh, uh, ta, uh, cooperative community committee for the Central Arctic Ocean, but now it has a new name. She told me, uh, but there is there they do have a, a the fifth report came out, and we're actually using uh, crossing that over with discussions on the Synoptic Arctic Survey and how to have a, a acoustics or what type of measurements could be done in order to take advantage when we finally are putting those ships back into play into the Central Arctic Ocean to try to get cooperative uh, measurements. So uh, I don't know, Candace, do you have anything to say if you're still on? Yeah, I'm still here, Jackie. Thank you Thank for the you. opportunity. Can you hear me? Yes, you yes. can. Thanks, Candace. Oh, okay. Good. Yep. Um, yeah. So just really briefly in October 2018, um, nine nations plus the European Union signed um, an agreement to prevent unregulated fisheries in the high seas of the Central Arctic Ocean um, until certain um, parameters were met. Um, the agreement has not yet um, entered into force. So once it enters into force, that will start the 16 year um, time period that is outlined. We are just waiting on ratification by a couple more um, of the signatories. However, um, all of the signatories did meet um, May of last year to start conversations for when the agreement enters into force. And one of those was to create what we are now calling the Provisional Scientific Coordinating Group. Um, and that body has kind of replaced what was formerly, as Jackie said, called FISCAL. And we had a meeting in Northern Italy right before um, the whole COVID-19 um, situation broke. I actually got home about five days before the outbreak in Milan. But um, that meeting was, I would actually say much more of a policy and kind of rule setting meeting than it was a scientific meeting. And my advice right now would actually be, Jackie, as you have been using the 2017 report, um, as our thinking hasn't really changed as to um, that being what we would recommend as the next steps for gathering um, the initial data and information that would be useful. Um, to this agreement. Um, we, we are hoping, obviously, um, once this pandemic ends, hopefully to meet again next year if possible. Great. Well, that's good in, uh, input there, uh, Candice. I would also say that we had a virtual meetings with uh, cruises that were going to do the Synoptic Arctic Survey this year and then next and are, are working on uh, standardizing the protocols. And so we have virtual sub teams working on that so that the uh, different cruises that go in some, some of the core measurements, there'll always be additional ones. And one of the activities, uh, one of the leads on the biology part is um, Pauline, and I, I'm not gonna try to say her last name from Sweden, <laughs> but she was on Mosaic and she was uh, on the first leg. And I think her team's out there looking at all different ways to look at fish in the Central Arctic Ocean, including with acoustics and nets and a variety of cameras and that type of thing. And so there'll be some set, some protocols coming out. 
So hopefully that's something we'll put it, we're kind of accelerated that because of our Asian colleagues actually going into the field and maybe the Canadians too, that uh, there will be some measurements coming out this year. So just an FYI to people on the line and that information uh, also related to uh, opportunities on these ships will be coming out uh, to BD at some time in the future, including uh, US options. Yeah, Jackie again, Candace. Um, thank you for bringing that that up. Um, Pauline, I also never try to say her last name. Um, was on Mosaic and did a lot of fish work. And as far as I know, actually um, was able to capture five um, fish with the different um, equipment that they were using. But she won't tell us what they were. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's very it's very frustrating. <laughs> I just want to know. But, yeah, um, she asked me about that, and she yeah. she very uh, until they get it published and not say anything. So yeah, um, but but I did forget I did forget to mention though um, we will be having a um, brief kind of meeting report meeting summary coming out um, shortly from the February um, meeting okay. of the Central Arctic Ocean Provisional Scientific Coordinating Group. Mm -hmm. Good. And this is Betsy Baker, for those not on the video. Um, I, as you know, retired from NPRB, but I am now ramping up part-time. Um, and I'll be working at the Wilson Center with Dave Bolton precisely on these issues. And so would love maybe in a smaller chat to see what messages. They really speak more to policymakers um, internationally and domestically, but to put the science front and center on this just as the agreement requires. So I would love um, input and conversations with some of you offline. Thank you. Yeah, and that's really good. I just put a plug in that we and the Marine Ecosystem Collaborative team have decided we're gonna have a, and working with uh, Bob Foy from NIMS and with our internet, uh, the chair of the International Synoptic Arctic Survey. And uh, we had one other player in there now and my mind has gone Zippo. Uh, but there, it'll be a, a, like an hour and a half call. It's probably going to be in September. So it's going to cut, it'll be focused in on the Central Arctic Ocean, the slopes and the Central Arctic Ocean. And just an FYI, there's a committee from the uh, um, ICES, Pisces Pain. These are acronyms. So the Arctic Council, the, that where that the team is working out that report on the integrated ecosystem assessment of the Central Arctic Ocean is coming out in September. The draft is going through, uh, or it might even be out in the form June, well, it's already June. So it'll be July or August, whatever. It's always, but they're moving into a second. Uh, so we're actually looking at drivers and, and, and pressure points for that. Uh, that is gonna be a phase two. The, uh, um, but those reports are going on, uh, going on now to evaluate uh, how the system, what we know about the system and what would be really Good to know about if we're going to start doing the, the, the sampling, what type of field program needs to be done to be able to make um, political de policy decisions and management. So stay tuned for September. That's as far as I know until we have our team lead meet, right, Danielle and Kathy? <laughs> yes. So I'm going to turn it back to you, Kathy, because it's two o'clock and uh, if they're three less o'clock. Three o'clock. Oh, we have a few more minutes. That's where you're at. <laughs> Depends on where you're at. Uh, so if there's any, uh, since I've been babbling, I'm going to zip it. Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, thanks. I, we really appreciate everybody uh, joining in and, and keeping uh, the connection going uh, while, um, you know, things are in flux with the different field seasons. Um, Danielle, is there any uh, summary comments or thoughts you would like to offer? No, thank you. I think it, it's great. I really appreciate everybody taking the time to connect and, and share information. Um, so no, I didn't necessarily have anything uh, else to offer. Um, I just want to kind of remind people to think about opportunities when you can't get in the field and you're not dealing with all of the gear packing and all of the other stuff to um, think strategically about the opportunity to maybe do some more synthesis type projects to kind of take data that we already have in hand and and look at it again in different ways um, and and think about how your future field sampling can build on it and i thanks danielle i have one more announcement because i think it should be a link that could be put into the chat box and that's the arctic science ministerial three 
there was a virtual meeting for that, but they're opened up for input by the scientific community on key themes and directions through um, that um, for science activities. And there's representatives, I don't know who they are for, for US, but I was one back in uh, Berlin two years ago. So, but this time has actually got a lot of, uh, there's a lot of forum and IARPIC is a dealing with it as, as I ask. So if we, there's a link in which you can go to through the IARPIC and you can fill out and add any comments that you want to. We had an open meeting for the, our MECT call, I think it was last month for that input, but maybe, uh, and you could put that link into the, the minutes so that people could know where to go with that. Yeah, I can include it in the notes and uh, they should be posted in the next couple of days. And so I just want to say thank you for uh, me, <coughs> input and um, I've learned some things. <coughs> Kathy, back to you. All right, well, I'll uh, conclude there unless anybody has uh, anything uh, they want to add. I, I see a lot of familiar names. Uh, thanks for joining in. And if this is your first time calling into a MECT call, uh, thanks for joining us. All right. And, and Anne, thanks for uh, moderating this too. Sure. No problem. And if you have any, any questions, updates, let me know. And if you're not on the mailing list, email me. Okay. Oh, and by the way, everybody, we won't have a <coughs> MECT call in July, because we have a team lead meeting. So our next one would be in August. Yeah. And you should get an email in the next two weeks with some uh, outline and the agenda.